So we're going to, anyone who's been to one of my homebrew talks before will know there's a lot of hand raising that has to go on. So I'm sorry. So who is, who's heard of homebrew it, before now? Very good. Who uses homebrew? Hopefully you have heard of it if you use it. Uh, who submitted a PR to homebrew? Anyone submitted a PR to homebrew which was closed and rejected by me? <laughs> oh, note, the majority of the people with their hands up are homebrew maintainers, so that's, that's fine. Um, great. Who likes putting their hand up? Way very fun. Uh, right, so... My beeper, there we go. Uh, if you want to contact to me about anything in this talk, easiest way is either Twitter or my personal email, which is on GitHub and my website and stuff like that. Uh, I come here with two hats on generally. I'm not going to talk too much about anything GitHub related today, but that's my day job. They pay my bills. They pay for me to be here. Thank you very much, GitHub. Um, I've been there about six years, and I'm working on GitHub sponsors now. If you find any of that stuff interesting, then feel free to like just grab me, hopefully not physically, uh, during FOSDEM and talk to me about it, and we can have interesting conversations. And similarly about Homebrew, if you want to talk about stuff like that. Right, so this talk, I'm going to talk about features and funding in Homebrew. These two things are completely related. They're definitely not just two blog posts I wrote that are jammed together to make a normal-sized talk. So, who likes features in software? If you haven't put your hand up, I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, particularly, new features are generally nice. I like it when I get to work on new features, and I like it when I release new features that other people like, which is very exciting. But a lot of the time, new features are not very good when I first release them because I suck at coding. So, the problem with Homebrew, uh, pre 1.0, is Homebrew, there's a lot of design decisions that are made that might look smart, but are generally made just because me or one of my predecessors are extremely lazy, because that's how it is. One of the nice things about being a software engineer for a living and doing open source, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, is the pain of knowing how, what you would actually do if you had time to do things the right way which I don't have time to do because I have now two small children and they don't tend to allow me as much time as my paid overlords at GitHub do to do things like write as many tests as I would like, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things you probably may or may not know with Homebrew is it uses Git and GitHub pretty heavily. So when you are doing updates of the package repository or updates of the package manager itself, that's just doing a Git pull from GitHub, essentially. So before Homebrew 1.0, when you ran brew update, or eventually when that became automated for you, then effectively that's just doing a git fetch, checking what the latest version is on GitHub, and pulling that down for the package manager itself and for all the packages. Now, this is quite good when you want to just have everyone running the same thing all the time, but it is not good if you like new features that are not broken, because it makes it quite hard to have subsets of users that you roll features out to when they are not quite ready yet. So now, as of, we're now at Homebrew 2 point whatever, uh, most people will now end up, when they run brew update, on a stable tag instead. So we now tag things in the repository. So when you run brew update, the main package manager itself, not the packages, we don't have any plans to do that, but the package manager itself, you will kind of jump between tags if you are most people. But if you are some special people, then you will get effectively the same workflow as before. You will be on whatever the tip is of the master branch and whatever the latest commits are. So that means if I push some PR or new commits or whatever it may be, then you will get them almost immediately. Now, you, you may wonder, am I some people or am I most people? Right, I'll tell you later, but ponder that question for now. The way most software generally works for doing betas and handling kind of features that maybe aren't quite ready yet, or just big refactors that might maybe aren't quite ready yet, is they might pop up some little box asking people if you want to use the beta or not. Or, in shorthand, do you like bugs? Or, if you want to be a little bit more philosophical, do you hate yourself? Uh, personally, I find almost any software I use on a day-to-day -day basis that asks me if I want to use the beta channel, I never do, because... Like, the general fact is, because I'm using software, I generally want it to work. And when it doesn't work, I generally get very annoyed. Uh, another problem I found is, because I've been working from home for 10 years, I'm not really used to, like, working in an office environment. So, 
now when software doesn't work the way I want it to work, my reactions are increasingly ridiculous, loud, and violent <laughs> towards my computer. So I don't really know that beta software is good for me or the structural integrity of my house at this point. On Homebrew, we do things a little bit differently. That basically, the fundamental question with Homebrew, instead of asking yourself, you know, do I hate myself enough to try this new software? It's really about, do I hate you? And the answer is, no, of course I don't. Well, obviously, I do still hate some people around Homebrew a little bit. Probably no one in this room. There's enough people blocked on the Homebrew GitHub organization that, you know, that probably indicates a little bit. But, I mean, to be serious, though, why do I hate you enough to make you some people? Why do I hate you enough to make you sit on the, on the master branch when you could be on a lovely, nice, stable tag that's a lot more tested? Well, so if you end up grouped in that little group, I happen to think you're a little bit special. I happen to think you're curious. There's something about you that makes you a little bit different from the average person in the world. And I think you're probably a bit more likely to be helpful. And that's a weird thing for me to have maybe attributed about you without knowing anything else about you. So how do I identify these things? Well, in Homebrew, we have the concept, if you look in the man page, we group our commands by, we have commands and we have developer commands. So a Homebrew command might be the normal way that you would use Homebrew with something like brew install wget. Most people are using these when they invoke Homebrew, when they work with it. This is how most people's entry point to Homebrew is through these. But then we also have things called developer commands, which are what you use if you want to contribute to Homebrew, if you want to be a Homebrew maintainer, if you want to submit a pull request, if you want to make some changes, even just like locally for yourself, then you're going to run one of these developer commands. So the fun fact is we track, not externally, but we track on your local machine whether you've ever run a developer command or not. And 99.9% .9 of people never have, and 0.1% of people have. So 99.9% .9 of people get the stable branch. I realize now I flipped these the wrong way around, but oh well. 99.9% uh, .9 of people get the stable branch, and 0.1% of people get the master branch. So again, why would we do this? This is maybe a little bit weird. So this was based on experience over the years of kind of observing how these different groups of users tend to file issues. So people who have never run developer com commands, you tend to get issues that look a little bit more like this. Those of you who are maintainers of any software would know the dreaded phrase, it doesn't work. It's generally not super helpful in figuring out exactly what the problem is and what the changes are that need to be made to do things. To be fair, though, I'm not blaming these people because, again, with tools like Homebrew, despite being, I guess, ostensibly a developer tool, it's now increasingly used by a lot of people who are, may not be developers at all, may be following some guide online, whatever it may be, and they're not familiar with the kind of open source, free software, bug reporting way of doing things. They don't know that you need reproducible instructions, et cetera, et cetera. But as a result, since we kind of made this move, people who only have run developer commands tend to make bug reports that look a little bit more like this. Or quite a lot of the time, I would say 50% of the time when it's a bug that's affected them directly and is a relatively simple fix, instead you get something like this, which is very nice. This is generally when this is explained. Uh, I find 89% of people go, oh, that's interesting, whatever. And 10% of people get very upset and don't like this idea that we are deciding for them effectively whether they get the unstable stuff or not. If you are one of those people, then you can set this in your environment, homebrew update to tag. That basically says even if you run a developer command or anything like that, you always want to be on the stable branch. So don't trick you into ending up on the master branch inadvertently. If you're the opposite and you're just excited to get out there and find some bugs, then you can set homebrew developer equals one. That will go and that does a few more things that will partly make sure you're always on the master branch, but then there's a few things that are warnings or don't print warnings um, that that will then turn into errors and stuff like that, which would be useful for you to help us fix. Generally, if you want to set this though, the, I would say the high level for a command like, for a, a flag like this is 
I'm prepared to submit pull requests to fix things that I encounter. If that does not feel like you, then feel free to opt not set that. So sometimes we get situations where we are working on new features where that like split between master and stable tags is not quite enough. So again, a lot of stuff we do, we will go and make a new change, whatever it may be, and then we do a new release of the, the package manager itself maybe once a week or so. And then once things kind of get into that stable tag, then they'll get rolled out to everyone. And normally kind of, you know, if we roll out something a bit more dramatic, then we'll give it a couple of days before we do a release to make sure that kind of any of those beta testers have been able to kind of potentially pick up on that, file an issue, file a PR, whatever it may be. And also like the homebrew maintainers ourselves, because again, we are all on the, the beta channel effectively. But sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes you need something which is going to last a bit longer that may need toggled on and off for individual machines or individual people or whatever it may be. So for that, we use feature flags. Who's familiar with the concept of kind of feature flagging? OK, like some people, not everyone. So again, back to the feature problem of, you know, we might want people to try new features, but often they are completely broken when we first make them. Particularly with stuff like Homebrew, there's some stuff where if we want to change the way the compilation process works, for example, it's not feasible for me to test 4,000 packages on my machine before I roll that out to everyone. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to just roll that out to everyone and break their stuff. So again, do I hate you? Not yet, because I want to try and make sure this stuff is a little bit more refined before it ends up being with you. So generally, the way we do that is... Similar, I guess, before, the way basically everything is controlled in Homebrew is through environment variables, because we don't have a configuration file. We just decided this is the way we like to do things. So we let users set environment variables for these particular cases. So generally, in the first case, if I'm rolling out something that I suspect is really broken, then th the first person to set that will be me. I will set that on my personal machine, because I'm using Homebrew for like work stuff, and I will basically wait to see what breaks. Internally in the code, obviously, we're checking for the presence of that variable. And then we can do like slightly different logic internally, whether you have that flag set or not. Then if we want to go a little bit more advanced than that, we can check if Homebrew developer is set. So that's going to basically group in all of the Homebrew maintainers and anyone who manually sets that flag, for which I don't think there are a whole number of people. But again, that's sort of the group who have opted in to receive more warnings and problems and stuff like that. Then if you, we want to not just put something in the master bunch or a stable tag, we can check that's the equivalent variable that's set for us for people who have run a developer command at some point. And then at that point, then it generally ends up in the stable branch. So the, the flow through these things is generally the first person testing a new feature that I makes at least is going to be me. Then it's going to be our CI system. We might enable that globally so we can see that across all the packages. Then various maintainers will enable it then the people on the beta channel, and then everyone else. So hopefully then we end up with new features that are not completely broken. So a brief side tangent for an employer plug. Uh, so that's one of the things about GitHub that I kind of stole this idea from, from them. Obviously, people have been doing feature flagging before GitHub, but they do this stuff generally very heavily internally as well. So almost anything I work on at GitHub is going to be used by feature flagged at least if it's some new feature or some big change in behavior. It's going to be feature flagged to just me first, then my team, then the employees at GitHub. And then sometimes we have stuff, if it's very relevant to open source maintainers, we'll flag in like people in a kind of subset maintainers community we have. And then we've started doing more like beta opt-ins and things like that. And then we roll out to everyone. So the next part of this talk, there's not really a great segue, but I'll try and make one up anyway. So talking about funding. So again, we there's a lot of talk about feature development and open source kind of getting better and better and stuff like that. And there's been in the last few years, I don't know how many of you have picked up on this, a lot of talk about like, oh no, is open source broken? Because you're starting to see big companies who make things you know, like maybe maybe you make some sort of thing that's maybe a bit like a database, but even better. And you want to write a bunch of code over the years to make this amazing, not quite a database, but almost like a database, really, really good. And you want to release it under an open source license and have lots and lots of people use it. 
But the problem is you can't get anyone to give you any money. So you basically go and maybe see if you can convince people to pay you for the open source project and no one really does and stuff like that. So you're asking yourself, well, how can I make new feature development? Okay, I'll make a company around my open source product. And then you, because you're making open source, no one's going to pay you directly for your thing. But maybe if you go to some people who can help people with stuff like this, then they can generally you know, throw some money at you and then that might help your company to grow over the years and things like that. And then, but the problem is eventually you get to a point where your company is making me making some money, but they're still not profitable and whatever it may be. And then you, you hit a bit of a wall where you realize like, oh, there's all these big kind of cloud providers who are not, in our opinion, giving us the fair share that we're due. And then as a result, you go and relicense all your stuff to non-open source licenses. You then say that that is open source software still and try and make package managers package your stuff anyway and just keep telling everyone that it's open source even though it's not anymore and then go around telling people, oh, open source funding is broken. So is open source funding broken? No, in my opinion, open source companies are broken. It doesn't really work to have VCs fund massive organizations who are going to go and then just change their licenses five years later. But in short, I don't really care about this problem, and neither should you, because I think the problems that bigger organizations who might make open source databases and then change their licenses a few years later to other things, not that I would name any names, the, the types of problems these types of organizations have, I think, are completely irrelevant to the open source ecosystem as a whole. Because actually, at the end of the day, what does your project need money for? Probably it does not need money for a shiny office. It does not need money for a Tesla in your drive. It does not need money for a whatever other things venture capitalist money injections to your organization give you. So if you want your Tesla, you're going to have to figure out another way of doing it. But if the problems you are having which mean that your project needs money are things like you need places to host your binaries and that actually needs to be paid for, or you need some sort of cloudy thing to run some services in and that has bills that needs to be paid. Or in our case, you need a CI system that actually tests all your packages, but none of the kind of cloud posted CI systems is anywhere near the scale or provide the infrastructure that you need, then you're going to need to get some money somehow from somewhere. So Homebrew found ourselves in this situation in 2013. We didn't have any CI. Back then, it wasn't as much of a thing. Certainly, back then, Travis uh, CI wasn't supporting Mac builds and stuff like that. So there was basically nothing that looked like it was going to be an option for us really to do. So we wanted to get some money. And the way you got money off random people on the internet you didn't know in 2013 was Kickstarter. So we launched Kickstarter. We got enough money to buy ourselves some computer hardware. And then we installed that and kind of ran that for a good few years, and that was fine. Unfortunately, we had a few problems with this. Right? So partly having physical hardware means that some sort of humans are going to have to manually deal with that. Normally, the humans who are physically closest to the hardware, which was me, and that sucks when that person is you all the time. Secondly, we had leftover money from the Kickstarter that we wanted to do stuff with at some point, and we feel kind of we are obligated to do something with at that point, but that was, again, in a bank account in the UK in pounds, and I was the only maintainer in the UK, so again, that was not ideal as well. And this stuff is all sounding very bus factory of one, so I was trying to go and shopping for other solutions. So in 2016, we kind of started talking with the Software Freedom Conservancy after looking at various other kind of software foundations and thinking that was the, the route home we was going to kind of start to go down in order to kind of have some, basically, more bus factor around our finances and stuff like that. So that provided us with a legal entity, so that entity could be the thing that owns things like physical hardware rather than any individual. It provides us with a 501c3, which is, in the US, the shorthand for an organization that can receive uh, donations and then people can claim that back on their tax return. And like companies like stuff like that for donations as well, because it makes it basically more valuable for them to give you money. And again, with it being 2016, we had like a PayPal account that we could get money sent to us relatively easy for on donations and a bank account if people want to go like and physically wire transfer stuff. So companies generally prefer this route though, so this was a little bit more handy. But the problem with this model of having like get just soliciting donations and getting them is it's not very stable. You know, you might get a nice, and we've got some 
big like one-off anonymous ten thousand dollar donations from big organizations or whatever it may be and that's really cool and really helpful but that doesn't particularly if with the stuff i mentioned before if you're paying a monthly fee for something you don't want big lump payments you want you would happily take lower payments which are rolling on month over month of the month so in 2017 we moved to that way of asking people for money on the internet which is patreon and that worked for us relatively well. We started to get a little bit of kind of monthly income and things like that. But again, you still have that problem of how do you actually solicit for people to give you a bit more money? So we started off by just putting it in our readme and saying, yo, we could do with some money for X, Y, and Z. Please give it to us. That didn't really work very well. Like, again, we got dribs and drabs, but most people are not checking that section of the readme to see stuff like that. Then 2018, we have like, a, I think, 10,000 followers on Twitter or whatever at this point. So we pushed on Twitter kind of asking, and then we saw a little bit of an uptick there. But the really impactful thing to our uh, funding in 2019 was we added a little message to the application itself and to the installer. So when you first install Homebrew, or when we roll out really things which we think are important to users, such as stuff like analytics, we display a little one-time message we check that you have a TTY, which is basically our way of more or less seeing, while well, you're not running this within some other script, and you're probably going to actually see this message. And we do like a console beep and stuff like that. So we've done that previously for kind of analytics to let people know that this is a thing we're doing and how to opt out. So we thought, hey, we could do this as a one-time message. People will only see this once per machine or when they install a new machine to solicit some donations. More or less just saying, okay, would you like to donate to the project? And then that's what happened here-ish. So that, that made a really... So this was when we sort of started, I guess, just before 2017, and had just the donation stuff in the readme, again, picking up slowly over time. Big jump there when we started asking on Twitter, and then the jump when we added the, the little nag message was fairly ridiculous. So And since then, we've been sitting fairly sort of statically on between two and a half and three thousand dollars a month which is pretty great um, and then as of 2019 we've added kind of github sponsors which is like plug plug that's something i work on at work so that's a nice other way for us to kind of get funds organizations are still in beta for that so we were kind of one of the early organizations to get into that but again within the next few months that should be open to all organizations um, but again that's a, a way that we've been able to get monthly income through uh, the GitHub platform, and that's like a few hundred dollars a month at the moment as well. So with that combined, we have kind of two and a half to three thousand dollars a month, which actually now gives us enough money to partly have maintainers fly here, and we have a, our annual general meeting for the second time on Monday, and partly to start actually paying for hardware and things like that that we need to run the project effectively. And we've done this without selling user data, which is, again, things which we have been accused of doing in the past. People worry about stuff like that with analytics, but it's something that we wouldn't ever consider. We've done it without asking people to donate again and again and again. Like again, I, I kind of, I don't mind when programs I use do that because I feel like that's within their right. But you do have to wonder, like, if someone has said, "No thanks, I don't want to donate," like three t or four times, how likely they are on the fifth, sixth, or seventh time to decide to donate and not just get really annoyed. We've done that without having a sort of like homebrew pro edition, some special version of homebrew with features limited, which are not open source, so people need to pay for or whatever. And surprisingly, we've done it without anyone really accusing us of selling out, and we've not had any backlash, as far as I can tell, to our donations and our funding stuff. This may well be partly because we, my advice maybe to other projects would be we effectively don't really make any promises on what you will get for donating to Homebrew and what the money will be spent on, except the fact that you know we're part of a software foundation and this isn't going to be, like, none of the money has gone in any maintainer's pockets individually or directly or anything like that. And before that would happen, there would be a very formal process of contracting and stuff like that. So basically, although we can't promise you what your money would be spent on if you donated to Homebrew, we can say that it will be used to kind of, for the project's mission and not just to buy me a Tesla. So with that, I think we can say that Homebrew is still quite good and things seem to be going better for the project as a result of doing this funding changes. So, thank you very much. And do we have time for questions? No.